a, a few of you, um, or I guess maybe quite a number of you, are, are familiar with, um, with Skills Ready, with the program that the Construction Foundation has been running now for um, three, four years. And one um, initiative within that is these, these project webinars. So this is not our first and it definitely won't be our last, um, but it's a, you know, it's a good way um, to present new projects, um, get, get some feedback and um, hopefully as well um, elicit new ideas and encourage you to um, submit your projects, try ours, tinker, uh, modify, and, and so on. So that it's a, it's a living exchange. And um, that's, uh, that's what I would like very much to thank the ITA for supporting this initiative. Uh, it really, it wouldn't be happening without their ongoing support. And we're very lucky to have both uh, Jason Lieber and Lisa, uh, uh, Lisa Layton um, uh, with us um, this uh, this afternoon. So um, I'm uh, I'm just wondering if we should, um, you know, what maybe we'll leave uh, the talk about uh, skills ready and ways to uh, connect with some of the other elements of it, the presentations and workshops and so on. Maybe we'll leave that to the end because for some of you, you'll be very familiar with, obviously you don't need to, to spend time on that, but those of you who are not, I'm quite happy um, to stay on and, and speak, to, speak to that a little bit um, longer. Um, and then I think we, you know, we can take a look at the, there's a you know, registration site, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Jesse who's gonna be speaking to this, this specific theme of today. All right, thanks Renee and welcome everybody. Thanks for being part of our webinar. Um, so uh, my job with Construction Foundation, um, I, I was sort of recruited from a high school teach, as a high school teacher and now I'm helping develop some of the projects in, um, in a way to sort of translate it into teacher speak so that the projects are really accessible for instructors and teachers. So this most recent um, series of projects that we've been developing, uh, my job in it was to help brainstorm with Renee and Jordan and a whole bunch of other people at Construction Foundation to come up with a list of possible projects to develop. And part of what we wanted them to be was not only super fun to make, um, but low waste. So we weren't having um, a whole lot of throwaway projects. We wanted them to be quality take home things that people would use at home or things that could stay at the school and be part of the school atmosphere. Um, we also wanted to introduce a tool or technique from a specific trade um, of all the different trades, but pick, pick one for each specific project and introduce people to a tool or a technique. And yeah, we wanted to just make them really accessible and available for instructors and teachers and students who might have a really varying experience level or a skills ability with these, these kinds of tools that we're introducing. So, Step one, we brainstormed a big list and we found a few themes within that. And one of them was a garden party theme, which we were pretty excited about. And we picked a whole bunch of projects that um, sort of fit within a, a garden or a patio kind of setting. So we consulted with a bunch of tradespeople and asked them about which tools and techniques could be used within these uh, projects that we were coming up with. And we invited a bunch of people to test them out for us. So I'm gonna go through some of the projects with you that we tried out on our build day. Um, and we're gonna go into a little bit of detail on a few of the projects, but this is just a basic overview of what our um, garden party looks like. So feel free to jump in and ask questions if you have any, and I'm gonna do my best to share my screen here with everybody. Okay, is that working all right? Can people see that? Okay, 
So the first project here um, was one that Renee developed uh, a, seed, a cedar planter. So using some carpentry tools and techniques as well as a little bit of horticulture to pick the plants when they were done. Um, this one is already available on our project website if you're curious to try this one out. And there's a, um, also we did a webinar on it uh, earlier and there's a how-to video that Renee developed with. It was your daughter, Renee, that helped you with that? Yeah, it's really sweet. So that's up on our project website as well, show you how to access that. Um, uh, another one that I was talking to Ingrid about earlier was our hydroponic garden. So we had uh, Emily Schmidt, a plumber in Victoria, and Andrea Dirtle, who's a plumbing instructor at Camosa, and they helped us develop this um, garden that uses uh, really common plumbing tools and materials to come up with this. And uh, so you, the, the whole point is to learn how to cut pipe, drill holes in pipe, and then um, also explore some of the horticulture of what, choosing which plants to grow in the garden. And uh, yeah, learning about the different nutrient solutions that you can use to keep them growing. And the next one we worked on were wind chimes. And these ones tie into uh could be tied into pipe fitting on um, these ones are actually made with emt electrical conduit so tied into an electrician's day-to-day -day job cutting the pipe um apparently they are very very loud <laughs> so we might experiment with using a different striker instead of the metal washer to hit them to make different uh, different sounds um but again cutting pipe drilling holes in pipe uh attaching them with wire um our next project, this is another one that Renee helped us with. He's going to go into more detail about the, the steps to building it and developing it, but it's a three part project where uh, first we, or first Renee built the tray, the wooden tray, and then um, tiled the bottom with those beautiful white tiles and made the handles. So here are a couple photos of Renee on build day at Camosun designing and making. Um, that one as well is now available up on the project website. Um, here's a video. I the, the, uh, sorry about the uh, quality of the video, but uh, we wanted to show you a little bit of action shots of Renee making the handles here. I don't want to take too much of your thunder here <laughs> Renee, with the uh, with the making of it, but Pretty cool to work with the, the copper in that step. And then there's a sort of a final photo of fitting the handle. Um, and then one of the projects that uh, I prototyped was a drinking glass made out of a bottle. And um, I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about how we developed and made this one, but the last one that we're going to go over, Dave is actually going to go into more detail on how to make these ones, but these are the concrete stepping stones for the garden. But we're going to be going into some detail about the tea tray, the glass and the stepping stone in a bit, but essentially after build day, we had a whole ton of prototypes. We had a whole ton of revisions to do on the procedures. Um, lots of suggestions, lots of photographs to edit and amass. And um, they've all been being uploaded onto our project website as we go. And mm, essentially my job is to make it usable and friendly for teachers uh, or instructors, anyone who wants to, to teach these projects to a group of people. So it could be makerspace clubs or after school clubs. Some of the projects are gonna be obviously easier for younger kids and older kids, but on the project website, it shows um, the the grades of students that it's it's best used for. Um, I guess Renee, I don't know if we're ready for the the tea tray details of how you made it. Ready, ready or not, here we come. So, um, as Jesse said, there's sort of three different elements to it. Um, the base, which you may not be able to see, but it's it's pretty thin panel board. Uh, quarter inch plywood be would uh, 
quarter inch plywood would be fine or even thinner material. Um, and uh, then the sides are one by three, just regular one by three. You can see, I mean, it's, um, I think Jesse, you chose this. So you, you, you know, it was nice stuff to work with. Not, you know, not naughty, right? <laughs> it's um, nice grain. So it was pretty easy to work with, soft. Um, so the, you know, as we kind of went through the stages, so yes, I, I made the wooden tray first, but um, the, the dimensions of the tray were, were kind of set by the tile, right? So, um, you know, we bought the kind of, I, I guess, sort of the easiest, cheapest tile um, that we could, um, could get. You could also do larger tiles. Um, and, if, and if you were choosing or letting the students choose their own tiles, that's gonna set the size of the, of the tray. Right, so laying out your tiles first on the plywood, leaving uh, enough for the outside grout uh, line. And then, then you measure your base. And from, from there, that sets the, the length and the width of the one by three that you're gonna cut, okay? So um, I didn't glue these. Again, I was I was trying. We were limited. Uh, Camosun College was kind enough to give us some space, but you know we were trying to move quickly through the the different stages. So um, I, I didn't think it was absolutely necessary to glue. I think you could glue them. There's there's definitely no no um, harm in doing that. But um, I used uh, pretty fine um, screws to to screw it together up from the base and it's, they're square cuts, right? There's no complicated miters. It was plenty strong enough. So, okay, so there we've got, we've got the base, we've got the, uh, the sides, then lay the, the tile back in. Yeah, so laid the, uh, the tile back in. Um, I used a, um, an adhesive and grout. It's adhesive and grout, one material and uh, I would suggest not doing that to, to rather than to maybe cut a little bit of a corner to get a separate adhesive and a grout, just because the, when you're using it as a grout, because it's got the, the, that adhesive element in it, it was really hard to clean up. So there we are. Anyway, we, we laid it in, put in the grout, um, you know, clean it up. And this, this is the, where you would, um, put the adhesive in and then let it dry overnight. Come back the next day or the next class, you know, a day or two, whatever, three later. Um, then put in, the, put in the grout. It goes fairly quickly. Um, let it harden up a little bit, then clean it up. So that's, that's a nice thing to do, you know, in, a, in another class. And while you're waiting for the, the, um, uh, the grout to dry enough for, for um, for cleanup, uh, the the handles. Now we tried different iterations of handle. Um, we tried three different types of handles: rebar, uh, conduit, and the copper pipe. Rebar proved to be, um, you know, problematic, too difficult with a pipe bender. It was it was a bit murderous. So that one got scratched off pretty quickly. Um, the the conduit, frankly, looked a bit ugly. And uh, so then we went to, to copper. Now, I, I, no pun intended, I have a soft spot for copper. Um, it's beautiful stuff and you can almost never go wrong with it. So I tried some different lengths. Um, I think the, the one that's under my, my hand there, I believe that's eight inch. That's the first set of handles that I made, um, which I've got, oh, I, I don't know if you guys can see or not, but anyway, I've got, I've got those. Um, it's not that it's you know critical or anything. I just so obviously I pound these flat. They're three eighths uh, soft copper. I I don't know that the softness is is again is an, an issue, but it just happened to be fairly soft copper. Um, pound it flat, and as you're pounding it, it naturally curves. You saw that in, in the little in the little video, um, and then you know you can you can pound it a little bit and get it. 
get it a bit more. It leaves it with a really cool texture on the inside, which is kind of nice. And it it feels good when you, you know, you you grab it. So the, I, I have fairly, you know, big hands. So I thought the eight inch might be good enough for, for younger students, um, but I wanted to have a little bit longer. So um, this set here, um, that's 12 inch. And, and I would say probably at the end, 10 or 11 inch would probably be the, the real sweet spot. Because in this, in this picture, you can see that the outside hole that I drilled there, that's running into those, the screws that is holding the frame together, right? So if it was an inch or two shorter, then you wouldn't run into that problem. But anyway, so then clean up the tiles, um, mark your drill through the, uh, by the way, I, I, I just, so a small vise or something, I think you could do it, you could do it with vise grips and just to bend it to get that angle, right? Um, and if you're doing that to take a little bit of scrap wood, on either side so that the teeth, either of the vise or of the vise grip don't mark up the copper. Um, and, and there you go. So then, then there's that, you, you drill the, the two holes with a cordless drill, soft copper. So it's, it's you know, just make sure you've got your eye pro on there and you can tell the kids whenever they're drilling, definitely um, that's necessary. And then you just, you screw it together and Bob's your uncle. You've got, you've got three trades there that you can you can speak to joinery to carpentry um, you know that's the basic layout skills you saw in one of those that I'm, I'm using a speed square obviously the tape measure those are like critical tools marking you know double checking sawing hand saw is, is plenty with that with or without a miter box depending on the skill level um, obviously you could do it with a, you know with a chop saw or a radial arm saw um, but not necessary. Okay. And then you can talk about tile setting, tiling, and um, again, the, you know, the, the, the different pipe trades, whichever way you wanted to go with that with the copper. Okay. Cost for material. That is a good question. The one by three is really cheap. Um, and so is that the panel board. Um, the copper is probably the most expensive piece and that may end up being, I'd have to price the copper seems to change price on, on a regular basis. I just bought some uh, at the Home Depot the other day and I think it was 20 feet for $20 of that three. Okay, it's stuff so a dollar a foot so roughly. It's, not, it's okay. not crazy. So two, three bucks for the those handles, let's say. Yeah. Um, and the tile, again, those each one of those. I think it was $5 for a square foot of that tile. Um, okay. But if you were going to use scraps uh, or pieces from other projects or, yeah. or things, so you're looking you're looking at a really nice project for ten bucks yeah. in materials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And less if you wanted to incorporate for older students or more advanced students uh, or people, they could um, use reclaimed wood or find other sources for the wood if you wanted to. So yeah. yeah. Or make your own handles out of what you've got laying around. Uh, one idea that we had was to bend um, like a spoon or another utensil and drill that on instead. So, a couple ideas. <laughs> Dave, would you like to talk about your stepping stone next? Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dave Leviza. I'm calling in from, uh, from Kelowna. I'm here today to talk about um, the uh, stepping stone. Um, we fabricated one uh, using a few different techniques. Um, it, it seems like a simple project, but you can actually add a lot to it uh, and depending on, on the age group also. Um, you know, first of all, you, you're doing some form work. So you're working with, uh, with um, I chose to work with, with a, a two by fours, but whatever you can get scraps of from, you know, whether it's a, a two by four, two by three, and depending on the depth of, of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of the uh, thickness of the, your um, pad that you want. I wouldn't necessarily go with a one inch material because when you're working with it, the tendency for it to split is a lot easier, but it would be strong enough for a 12 by 12 pad. Um, you know, the nice thing about the formwork is um, you're, you're, um, um, you're getting to use some hand and our power tools depending on, um, 
on the age group. Um, obviously, if, if it's a younger group, you, you may you may want to pre-cut. Um, um, anyway, so involved in the formwork, you, know, you have your calculations, uh, you have your layout, your measurements, um, and different techniques of, um, of, of doing the formwork. Uh, I, I always choose the uh, a wraparound method. If, if you look in the photo, um, in, in the photo, I'm just measuring a diagonal to make sure that the, actually the form is square, so the pad ends up to be, to be a, a, a true square. Um, if if um, I'm just talking about the uh, the type of form, usually I go with a wraparound, which which means that every piece of that form is the same length, rather than having two long ones and two short ones, because um, a lot of times you'll get confused if you're not really concentrating on, it and you're not going to end up with a square. So a wraparound, uh, you're just you're nailing the sequence the same way, and you're just lapping over. So it simplifies. Um, the forming process, uh, which eliminates a, a, lot of, a lot of the waste. Uh, the thing I like about the project too is, is not only the, uh, uh, the formwork part of it, but there's a lot of cross curriculum um, that, that, you, that you can uh, include in this. You know, first of all, the, the math, you, you have the volume calculations. Um, you know, depending on, on the type of, of uh, you, you can actually buy a ready mix in a bag um, so that they come in anywhere from 40 to 80 pound bags. Uh, you know, so there's some volume calculations on, you know, you want to you uh, uh, do your calculations so that you have the minimum amount of waste. Um, so, you, you know, you, you, you might consider the, uh, the depth of the, uh, uh, or the thickness of the pad by depending on, on the, uh, you know, the size of bags that you buy. So you have a, a ratio there, you know, you, you're, so you're dealing with the ratio and proportion, you're dealing with volume calculations, uh, you, you're, digging, you're dealing with some, some trick, just, you know, you're measuring your diagonals. Uh, making sure it's square, um, and if like, there's different mixes of concrete, uh, you know you can get the ready mix. Uh, they recommend that you do a two inch uh, for the, the strength that you want. Um, there are additives you can add to concrete, uh, even just uh, um, fiberglass fibers uh, that will give you extra strength. So you can actually make it thinner. Uh, it's tough to do it less than a, an inch and a half uh, because it, of the stones in it. It's hard to get uh, you know a good finish on it. You want to make it strong enough so it's going to last, though. Um, so, anyways, there's a math a component. Uh, there's also the you know the chemistry. There's a chemical reaction. You can study you know, the the chemical reaction between the, the cement and, and the and the uh, and the water and how that uh, and all the components um, or the aggregates involved in the concrete mix, um, how they all um, um, bind um, together to create. Concrete, it, it's a, a term that's misused a lot is cement and concrete. Cement is usually Portland cement, which is the powder. The concrete is a mixture of sand, uh, larger aggregate, uh, Portland cement and water. So there's those ratios there too. If, you, you know, if you're in a position where you can bring in some sand and grab and you can actually do portion mixes, uh, you know, a one, three, three or one, three, four mixture with water, which is about 0.55% um, ratio to the, uh, mixture of the uh, water to the to the concrete. Um, so yeah, we went with the the one form we went with was a three and a half inch, and I found that um, the forty pound bag was um, it was actually a little bit too small, or it didn't it didn't fill the the twelve inch by twelve inch by three and a half. So what you can do is just put some some gravel in the bottom of it to sort of fill the void to to uh, um, make the you know the pad a bit smaller to accommodate accommodate the bag size. I think the, the bags uh, are about six dollars average uh, for a 55 pound bag. So that's roughly what you're going to pay for a pad is about five to six bucks. Um, it, there is, uh, you know, if you're mixing it by hand, um, it, it is a bit uh, labor um, intensive. Uh, you have to make sure you have to keep mixing it um, to make sure that co that consistency is, is proper. Um, and, and then um, you know, once you get that in your form, it shows you in, in the photo here, just screening it off, leveling off the concrete. Um, so, you know, it, it's, um, you know, you're working with your, your, your hand tools, making the form, you're, you're working on your, your uh, hand-eye dexterity, you know, whatever to, to uh, um, you know, the use of tools. And, and, and then you get into a finishing product. Uh, uh, you know, once you screen it, you're gonna, you want to get a, a wood float to, uh, Basically, what you're doing is you're floating down any of the rocks from the surface, and you're bringing the paste up because the paste is where the strength is. 
And then, um, and then just showing in the folder here, just showing you an edge trimmer, which rounds the edges a bit so they're not chipping off. Uh, one thing about the concrete, if, um, if you put too much, mix too much water in it, um, it'll, it'll still cure. Um, problem is, is that, you know, in a pad like this, not a big deal, but if the more water you put in it, the more it's gonna shrink. So the less, or the more chances of it um, cracking. Um, also, if there's a lot of water and you can't really finish the top surface, to all the water, top water bleeds off. So you know, if, if your mix is fairly thick, uh, you can you know, either put a broom finish on it right away and leave it, um, or you're gonna have to wait a bit for it to set up before you can actually trawl it. Uh, we, we experimented, yeah, as soon as a broom finish, as soon as the, the water on top was off, we could just do one, one swipe of the broom. You have a nice uh, surface that, that's a uh, non-slippery surface. Uh, we, we experimented with, you know, putting our handprints and stuff in, just making sure that, you know, the students wash their hands very quickly or right after because, uh, you know, there's, there are chemicals, um, you know, in the concrete. Um, Dave? Yes. Quick question. I just out of curiosity, you mentioned earlier that the reaction is, is there enough material there for the students to feel, because it's an exothermic reaction, for them to feel the heat? Absolutely, because because that's what it is. Hydration is the the, the uh, um, uh, chemical the, the heat chemical reaction with the the, the, the cement and, and the water. You can actually feel the heat of, of that okay, uh, cool. that, that concrete. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and usually, once uh, like when you're doing a bigger pour, um, you know, once it kicks, once the hydration starts, I mean, it, it happens quickly. Obviously, it depends on the weather, and and, and you know, it depends on when you pour. You might have to. Uh, keep the surface wet overnight if it's really hot out, uh, just by putting uh, uh, a mister and putting plastic over top. But you just have to watch if the plastic touches the surface, it's going to leave that that mark of the plastic. So you might want to elevate it a bit. So concrete does not, um, um, it takes 28 days for concrete to, to cure up to about 80%. And then another, another, uh, couple of years to get to 90% and it's it continually getting strength after that. So usually you're on a pour and you look at a high rise and whatnot and you, you see all these, you know, especially the, um, you know, using the fly forms and you see all these posts up after they pour, that's just because the concrete hasn't, you know, maxed out to its strength and, and it, an ability to, to hold itself and support the, uh, the, the, uh, the weight above it. So whatever, there, there's a lot, a lot to concrete. Um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of calculations if you want, uh, um, and, you know, some, some chemistry in there. If you have, if, if you're fortunate to have a, a, a school project where you actually have, you know, maybe a garden on site and you're doing a bunch of pads, you know, it, it'd be nice. You could bring in, you could do it cheaper, bring in, you know, maybe bring in a parent or somebody, that, a concrete person. You know, you could have just a, a, a small electric um, um, cement mixer and have the gravel and the sand and all that there and mixing that. And, and someone could actually could be turning and mixing it and just pouring it into buckets and they could, you know, go and place it in, in, in these pads and you get quite a few of them done, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a morning or a few hours, whatever. And, and I'm not sure if we have a picture or not. I, I, I showed one where we, where we put some dye in the concrete. It adds a bit more to the cost of it, but you can get a, a whole array of, of colors. So if you want to, you know, make your garden colorful and different steps and have their initials in it or something, there's, there's some creative things that you can actually do with it to, to really spruce up, uh, you know, your garden and, and uh, whatever. Maybe leave, put, leave putting in like little colored pebbles or, or pieces of tile or glass or something. Yeah, you, on the surface. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as long as, you know, you do, you're planning ahead and, and uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're doing that at, at the right stage with the con before the concrete sets up. But. Um, yeah, for mixing, um, you know, you want to have some plastic out. You can mix it, you know, on the ground or on a piece of plywood. Um, you know, people say, "Well, I'll throw it in a in a in a, uh, in a pail and use a drill." Well, you have you need a lot of strength for that. You know, I could see maybe a senior student being able to tackle that. Somebody holding that because it can get pretty dangerous using using the electric drill. I mean, you can buy um, you can buy a quick set uh, high strength concrete uh, but once again it, it's a quick set so you have to really be well prepared um, and so it, it allows you to do the finishing quicker and it allows you to actually to do a, a thinner pad because it, it's a it's a higher strength uh, <laughs> thanks for going over it and building it on build day for us we've got we've got some time could you uh, 
let us explore your glasses because sure. those were, were neat and very beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I'd love to show you. Um, so I, when I first brainstormed this project, I had chatted with a whole bunch of uh, glass shop owners and glazers just to see what kind of tools of the trades they were using these days and what what their day-to-day -day sort of dealings with glass actually were and a lot of what they had to say was that their jobs these days are just installing pre-assembled windows so they're not actually doing a whole lot of um, cutting of glass and edging um, of the the glass so um, yeah, one of them suggested uh, this this uh, glass project um, where you're cutting off the bottom of a bottle. Um, let's see, cutting off the bottom of a bottle and then um, working with the edge of the glass with sandpaper until it had a nice uh, finish and a profile to it. Talking about sort of the different uh, edge profiles that you could make um, or that you can get glass in. Um, but what I found was that uh, using the glass cutter was pretty tricky to freehand it. And I thought that would be quite dangerous for little hands of people trying to freehand um, the scoring line to go around a bottle with this, this rotary cutter. Um, so I kind of thought that the perfect solution might be to use some of the tools that these glazers were telling me about that they use every day, uh, like saws and drills and all these kind of um, mostly woodworking tools almost um, to build a little jig. So I used some scrap two by fours and uh, a table saw to cut a groove into the lower one and then um, drilled some pilot holes uh, and inserted some screws on the bottom uh, and then screwed a little uh, piece of two by four at the bottom to support the bottom of the bottle. So basically, how it works is that whatever bottle you're using fits into the um, jig like this, and then your rotary tool fits into a little um, groove that was pre-cut. And then you roll the, the bottle around so that you get a nice score line along it. And then you actually use heat, uh, sort of rapid heating and cooling, and the whole thing just think cracks and the top comes off. Not always super cleanly, uh, depends on how, how careful you were with making sure that one line was continuous. But I found that within, uh, I had a better than 50% uh, success rate with getting a nice clean line on it. And then from there, uh, you're just using sandpaper and a flat surface to sort of, um, yeah, uh, edge it and you can put a little bit, bit of a bevel on the side as well and working just up through the grits until it's nice and um, safe. Obviously you would have to get an adult to approve that uh, edge before anybody used it as a glass, but um, someone suggested using a, a little piece of fruit or something, running that along the edge to see if that um, uh, split it at all. Um, and then one uh, finishing idea with it. I don't know if you can quite see. Um, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can use a, a Dremel uh, with a little uh, a, abrasive tip on it to actually etch whatever you want to on the front. So what I did was took a, a photo of a sailboat and I put it inside the glass and then I just traced along the outside with the Dremel. Uh, obviously wearing um, a dust mask and safety goggles for that because you don't want to have that dust, um, glass dust going in your eyes. Uh, outside is a good idea for this one too, if you can, if you're going to be using the Dremels to etch. But you can also get etching cream uh, is also available um, to do, uh, you would just like tape off an area and put the etching cream on and it actually chemically degrades the glass a little bit to etch it. And then you wash it off and peel the peel the glass off, or sorry, the tape off, and you get a similar finish. Um, I've also done these um, where I use a, a vinyl sticker and then actually a sandblasting uh, gun and, or, or like a sandblasting hood, uh, which depending on whether you're an automotive uh, shop in, in the school has a, a sandblasting hood or something, you could actually sandblast these in, in there too. Um, yeah, those are my little glasses. And uh, that'll be up on the project website probably tomorrow in two parts. One part one to make the jig 
and the second part to actually finish and edge the glass properly. Yeah, so you mentioned a heat cycle or something to split the bottle mm -hmm. the torch or something or how do you warm and cool the oven or um what i used was uh, a candle and i lit it uh, and just um kind of twisted the uh, score line right over the candle and then i had a bucket of ice water and you plunge it into and most of the time it only took the one hot to cool to crack it um, another option that I've seen used before is um, boiling water, boiling, bo boiling water over that and then cracking it. But I was a bit concerned about the boiling water sort of splashing here and there uh, if kids uh, didn't have their hands kind of facing up. So I went with the candle. Um, but yeah, there's different heat cool kind of systems. And you can go back and forth from hot to cold if it doesn't work on the first try, it usually does on the second. So. Cool, thank you. Um, um, uh, the irrigation system. Oh yeah, yeah, it's connection. Uh, oh, Carolyn just asked if we could show the hydroponic garden again as well, um, which I can do. Um, yeah, the irrigation system was one of the ideas that Emily, uh, the uh, one of our plumbers uh, in Victoria who I was chatting with suggested. So um, it, it comboed really well with an idea of a cold frame, a uh, little cold frame greenhouse as well. So um, I'm hoping to work with her to develop uh, an irrigation system for a a smaller sort of garden area. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to look like yet because she's going to help me design it. <laughs> um, and for Carolyn there, uh, a, bit, a few more pictures and chat about the hydroponic garden. Um, I just wanted to see if you could explain a little bit about how you did it. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so I worked with I worked with Emily Schmidt and and uh, Andrea Durgle as well, and basically describing it to me over a Zoom of uh, the tools and the techniques that she would use. So essentially, um, cutting the pipe. Um, here we go. So measuring out uh, a length of PVC. We started with three foot. You can actually use uh, up to ten feet. The the PVC comes in ten foot length. So. Uh, the pump that we have, the little aquarium or pond pump that we use should pump water into whatever length of pipe you had. Um, and then this is cutting through it with a, 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 a giant pipe cutter. Um, those, I had to buy one uh, for the project. It was almost $50 um, at the Home Depot to buy a pipe cutter of that size, but it actually makes the cutting really straightforward and easy for small hands um, as opposed to a hacksaw or whatever but it's also possible to use a hacksaw and then from there you soften the edge a little bit with a file or with some sandpaper and then um, I don't know if you can see these big black um, fittings they're flexible couplings that bring the diameter help bring the diameter down from two inches down to this half inch tubing that we use um, so essentially on the end of each of, or each end of the pipe, we have this flexible coupling that, uh, it's, it's really straightforward to use, just using a nut driver or a screwdriver to tighten all of the, um, the ends of the couplings together and then to tighten the, uh, pipe, uh, the pipe or the hose clamp on the end with the flexible tubing. And then, yeah, and then you complete the circuit with, uh, one on either end of those, one gets, uh, put in a, a water bucket with the aquarium pump or the pond pump and up it goes and the water flows through the pipe and out the other side straight back into the bucket so i'm also looking at developing uh, like a living wall with that where you have a series of pipes um, where it sort of just washes into the next one and down 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 uh, but possible future projects to accommodate uh, yeah a whole wall of them perhaps, but I have to figure out how to attach them all to the wall or make them sturdy so they don't spill all over a, a classroom or a kitchen or wherever they're being used. So. And, uh, and again, Ingrid, if you're still there, I would really love to work with someone in developing a, 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 a sort of ways to germinate plants and, and what grows well in a hydroponic garden and those kinds of things, because uh, it'd be really interesting, especially if there were maybe uh, plants from the local area like wild mint or something that we could figure out how to grow and and use and if they were edible that would be really cool to make some mint tea in a classroom or something so.
I, I think I'll, I'll sort of end it here. And then as, as mentioned at the beginning, those of you that want to um, stay on for a couple of minutes and talk a little bit more about some of the other skills ready initiatives and, and how, to, um, how to register for those or how to you know, uh, get that into your school, um, I'm happy to stick, along, uh, stick around for as long as, um, as you want to chat. Um, and I think, Jesse, you can also maybe go to our website quickly and just oh, show yeah. how to submit your projects. If you, you've got a project that you want to share with your colleagues around the province, um, this is how you can go about doing it. This is our, this is our project's website. Um, so you can scroll down. You can see we've got our, our three parts of the tea tray and the two parts of the stepping stone. And we have quite a library of projects that are already up there um, available. This is the cedar and steel picnic table and benches that uh, Renee's going to be talking about in the future. Um, we don't have the upload your own project um, feature on here anymore because we were having some technical issues with it. But I believe there's a contact. Uh, you can subscribe at the bottom and if you Actually, I'm not sure, Renee, what, uh, if someone wants to make their own now that they're now that it's not available on the um, website to upload it, uh, possibly send Jordan an email or send you an email about. Uh... <laughs> Jordan or myself, those of you that have my my contact info, either one of us will will be able to get your your project. It, it is, will be a little bit of a, a process, usually just back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just just getting sort of clarification so that it uh, is the most accessible possible. Um, some of you that were on the call or or uh, were on the call uh, will recognize some of these projects that came from you. So mm -hmm. uh, this is this is where they they end up, and then they end up going around the province, uh, which is really cool to see how they continue to evolve and and. Um, like I said earlier, how they live on and on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and this one, what I really like about this website is all the, the ties back to the BC curriculum. That's been something that I've been adding a little bit to it as well. But anyway, uh, so projects.skillsready.ca is how you get to that one. <laughs>